aspect of Thomas Merton's life. Thank you, Martin. <coughs> Thank you very much, Martin. Can you hear me if I speak about that level? I'll hold the mic here. Before I go on to... You can't hear? You think so? Okay. How's that? Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Not all right? Yes. Okay. I think it's better if I hold it here. What about on the left? They can't hear. They should sit down here. Well, there you go. They're probably Catholics. Roman Catholics. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> With Roman Catholic gatherings, I always set the chairs up and then remove the front row, which is always empty. So. <laughs> Thank you, Colleen, for your wonderful introduction and uh, giving us lots to think about. I find when I'm set the task of saying something about Thomas Merton, it's like a child in a lolly store. There's just so much it's difficult to focus on any particular thing. I hope I've focused enough to give you something worthwhile today. Before I proceed with what I have written down here, let me uh, make three observations by way of indicating my own deep appreciation of and indeed affection for Thomas Merton and also give you uh, sort of signposts for a, a re receiving of what Merton has to write. One of the things you have to be aware of when you approach Merton is he's superficially easy, but there are great depths there that are often missed. The first observation concerns the parable from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13, verse 44. A man was going through a field. He found a treasure. With great joy, he went off and sold everything and bought that field. This is one of a number of parables in chapter 13 of Matthew's Gospel about the kingdom. Now, I won't elaborate it except to point you in the direction that the French hermeneutic scholar Paul Ricoeur suggests when he gave a sermon in Paris in the late 60s and was given the task of addressing the question, do the parables still have the power to set us in motion? And he came down very firmly and resoundingly on the side of affirmation. He said, provided you know how to listen to them. They appeal to the imagination, not the rational mind. They are not moral fables. They are stories that invite you in. Listen with your imagination, become part of the plot. And he said the plot in this particular parable is very clear and very powerful. First of all, there's a finding, then there's a selling, and then there's a buying. The finding precedes the selling, and the selling precedes the buying. Those last two can go together. I think sometimes in our Roman Catholic tradition anyway, we put the selling before the finding. If you haven't found the treasure, the selling will become a very burdensome, even oppressive experience. If you have found the treasure, you will keep on asking and seeking, what do I need to let go of in order for the treasure, the kingdom, to come alive in me? I think that's a particularly pertinent parable in understanding Thomas Merton. The second observation I would make is Merton is at his best and mostly when he writes from experience. He's deeply personal. This was one of the obstacles to people who were looking for the more abstract hangover from the 19th century, I would suggest, when theology and we didn't even talk of spirituality when I went to the seminary in 1965. It was spiritual theology or was still ascetical and mystical theology. It was a very rational, abstract thing. As one Jesuit, George Maloney, God bless him, said, we Jesuits used to say, that see Jesus, see Jesus run, run like Jesus. <laughs> That's assuming people haven't found the treasure. That's presuming that the Christian life is a willful exercise. What Rollo May points out or calls in his marvellous book, Love and Will, 
Victorian voluntarism that got us into all sorts of strife. It's not about you or me, it's about God. It's about God overtaking us and letting God overtaking us so that we are drawn by delight, not driven by duty. The third observation I would make is a very personal one from my own experience. In the mid-1980s, I did the Myers-Briggs. Remember the Myers-Briggs? Not in favour anymore, but it used to be very trendy. I did the Myers-Briggs for the second time, and I did it more from a professional point of view to see just how I would come out, as it were. The person who gave that inventory to me, before she gave me back the results said, and she had um, given it to a number of Mars, and she said, do you feel lonely? It's an odd question. Oh, I did the Myers-Briggs love. I didn't hear to come here <laughs> for that therapy. But uh, quite apart from the Myers-Briggs and this particular person, I started to think. I never would have thought of myself in the seminary, seminary as being lonely. But in retrospect, I think I was. I didn't fit there. I'd gone through the state school system. The tribal influence in the seminary was Catholic schools, particularly one college that we had in Lismore, St. John's College. And I tried very hard to fit. I expended a lot of time and energy and talent fitting in. And what this encounter with the lady giving us the Myers-Briggs prompted me to think, and it popped into my mind. It wasn't something I grasped, but it occurred to me I don't fit. I am a misfit, but I do belong. And hot on the heels of that realization, I looked around at my conference and says, they're all misfits too. <laughs> but they all belong. We're all misfits, but we all belong. That little epiphany has helped me immensely with Merton, and Merton has helped me immensely with that little epiphany. All right. With those three observations in your consciousness, let me proceed with my paper, which I've entitled Thomas Merton... Thomas Merton, Prophecy or Nostalgia? A Reflection on Solitude and the Path Towards Mysticism. Now, we're just going to you know, sort of fly by. It's like when you get one of those planes that gives you a tour over the landscape. That's about all we can do. There are immense depths in Merton, especially when it comes to contemplation. I've handed out a sheet. I hope you've all got a copy of it. It's four pages on two sheets of paper. Um, there's a reading list there. There's a number of books that I would recommend before others. One of the best little books I've read on Merton in recent years is um, Dom Ude's Bamberger's book about Merton, and I've indicated that there, and I depend on him a little bit. All right, starting with, I'm going to give you quotations from Merton and just hang some thoughts around those. And the first quotation is from his autobiography, It was my defeat that was to be the occasion of my rescue. I think in this little story about Merton, taken from his autobiography, we find something that will, perhaps alarmingly, connect with many in our generation. The question was asked earlier about younger people. My approach would be not to try to in introduce them to Merton first up, but try to introduce them to themselves. I think one of the great sadnesses of our culture is it's a disconnected and disconnecting culture. I would recommend one of those TED talks by a lady, a psychologist in the United States called Sherry Turkle on the need for solitude. 
she talks about the influence of social media and how it intrudes in our lives and we've all got 500 friends and we're intimate with none of them so it's the disconnectedness I think we need to address but Merton experienced it in his time in his own way in 1936 he was at Columbia University he was continuing the addictive and profligate life he had grown used to at Oakham then at Cambridge he writes of that time at Columbia three or four nights a week my fraternity brothers and I would go flying down in the black and roaring subways to 52nd Street where we would crawl around the tiny noisy and expensive nightclubs that had flowered on the sites of the old speakeasies in the cellars of those dirty brownstone houses there we would sit for hours packed in those dark rooms shoulder to shoulder with a lot of surly strangers and their girls while the whole place rocked and surged with storms of jazz he then goes on to reflect it was not that we got drunk no it was this strange business of sitting in a room full of people and drinking without much speech and letting yourself be deafened by the jazz that throbbed through the whole sea of bodies binding them all together in a kind of fluid medium it was a strange animal travesty of mysticism often he missed the last train back to Long Island where he lived with his grandparents occasionally he managed to get to the Flushing bus station on the off chance he might catch a bus home he writes there's nothing so dismal as the flushing bus station in the gray silent hour just before the coming dawn there were always at least one or two of those same characters whose prototypes I had seen dead in the morgue and perhaps there would be a pair of drunken soldiers trying to get back to Fort Totem among all these I stood weary and ready to fall lighting the 40th or 50th cigarette of the day towards the end of that year 1936 Merton describes an event that sounds very much like a nervous breakdown he was riding the train from Long Island into Manhattan he writes it was as if some center of balance within me had been unexpectedly removed and as if I were about to plunge into a blind abyss of emptiness without end he went to the Pennsylvania Hotel and consulted the house physician the doctor put him in a room in the hotel suggesting to him that he needed to rest Merton writes you could hear the noise of the traffic coming up from far below on 32nd Street but the room itself was quiet with a quietness that was strange ominous unable to sleep Merton was drawn to look at the window that window it was huge it seemed to go right down to the floor maybe the force of gravity would draw the whole bed with me on it to the edge of that abyss and spill me headlong into the emptiness and far far away in my mind was a little dry mocking voice that said what if you threw yourself out of that window after attempting various ways to deal with his perilous situation he concludes here I was scarcely four years after I had left Oakham and walked out into the world that I thought was going to ransack I was going to ransack and rob of all its pleasures and satisfactions I had done what I intended and now I found that it was I who was emptied and robbed and gutted what a strange thing in filling myself I had emptied myself in grasping things I had lost everything in devouring pleasures and joys I had found distress and anguish and fear such was the death of the hero the great man I had wanted to be if my nature had been more stubborn and clinging to the pleasures that disgusted me 
If I had refused to admit that I was beaten by this futile search for satisfaction where it could not be found, and if my moral and nervous constitution had not caved in under the weight of my own emptiness, who can tell what eventually would have happened to me? Who can tell where I would have ended? It was my defeat that was to be the occasion of my rescue. Pause there. Can I suggest to you that what Merton describes there in very stark terms may not be far from the experience of many, especially the younger generation. Hugh McKay, in one of his earlier books, quotes the uh, uh, Bureau of Statistics figures in 1998 of attempted suicides in Australia of males and females between the ages of 15 and 24. 1,000 every week. 50,000 over the year. You've got to ask why, what's happening? Thomas Merton is here in the midst of a profound spiritual crisis. And I don't think we should miss that point. Yes, there is a physical and a psychological component. Yes, he needs rest. And he needs to be more sensible about the way he lives. Like stop smoking 40 or 50 cigarettes a day. <laughs> But more than anything, he needs to set his house in order. He reminds me of the Australian writer Kim Mahood in her marvellous little book, Craft for a Dry Lake. She says, when I finally crawled out, the landscape had changed in all sorts of subtle ways, or the way I saw it had changed, which amounts to the same thing. I had encountered someone in the fault line whom I didn't know and whom my own particular set of myths could not accommodate. She crawled out with me, inarticulate and storyless. And although she looked at the world through my eyes, when I tried to speak for her, the language was crippled and absurd, full of psychological cliché. Over the years I learned and am still learning to listen to her silences. If my own busy voice goes on for too long, she begins to howl. A primitive psychic noise which cannot be ignored. Merton needs to pay attention and listen to the primitive psychic noise welling up from his bowels. This near-death experience has been an awakening for him. In this moment of awakening, he needs to ask the most fundamental and practical question any of us can ask at any moment of our lives. What's happening here? And listen. Listen with the ear of the heart, as Benedict was to teach him through the rule of life he eventually followed in Gethsemane. Merton is later to write, we may be true or false, the choice is ours. Merton was a very experiential writer. He learned to listen to the silences and the howls by writing. He submitted to the truth and wisdom unfolding there and made it available to others. His journals are like footnotes to his life and teachings. For example, we can hear the voice of experience in this reflection. Trees and animals have no problem. God makes them what they are without consulting them. And they are perfectly satisfied. With us, it's different. God leaves us free to be whatever we like. We can be ourselves or not, as we please. We are at liberty to be real or to be unreal. We may be true or false. The choice is ours. We may wear now one mask and now another and never, if we so desire, appear with our own true face. But we cannot make these choices with impunity. Causes have effects, 
and if we lie to ourselves and to others then we cannot expect to find truth and reality whenever we happen to want it. If we have chosen the way of falsity we must not be surprised that truth eludes us when we finally come to need it. I'll not be describing Merton's path to conversion and provisional baptism in the Catholic Church on November the 16th, 1938, or his path to entering the Cistercian Monastery in Kentucky on December the 10th, 1941. Suffice it to say that his life took on a very different focus at this time. That focus was characterized by two particularly deep and enduring themes, solitude and mysticism. Merton's awakening meant he began to see himself in the world in a very different way, like the man who discovers the treasure in the field. He cannot go on living the way he's been living. He writes in his autobiography, all I know is that I walked in a new world. Secondly, his baptism meant a radical new way of being. He took the theology of the sacraments, particularly baptism, very seriously. He writes, For now I had entered into the everlasting movement of that gravitation which is the very life and spirit of God. God's own gravitation towards the depths of his own infinite nature, his goodness without end, and God, that center who is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere, finding me through incorporation with Christ, incorporated into his immense and tremendous gravitational movement, which is love, which is the Holy Spirit, loved me. Clearly, Merton felt deeply loved by God in a way that he didn't feel deeply loved by his mother. He had an affection for his father, but I think basically he felt sorry for his father, who was a fairly hapless character, probably a lovely man. Colleen mentioned uh, Ruth Jenkins' uh, journal. You know, everything Thomas did when he was born was recorded, and then it stopped suddenly at the age of, I think it might have been when John Paul was born. When Ruth died of stomach cancer, when Thomas was six, he remembers sitting in the car outside, and it's raining, and he was handed a letter, which his mother had written some time before, to say, this is, when you receive this letter, I'll be dead. I think Merton's difficulty with women, very ambivalent over his life, can be sheeted home to the relationship with his mother. I hope I'm not sounding too Freudian on that, but I think it's common sense. He never had a good relationship with her. But I think he felt the love of God in a very powerful way that gave him security and grounding. Both his awakening and his baptism oriented Merton towards a life focused on being rather than doing. The centre of gravity had shifted in his life. Merton expressed this succinctly a little over a year before he died. We exist solely for this, to be the place he has chosen for his presence, his manifestation in the world, his epiphany. If you wanted a summary statement of Merton and his teaching, that's it. I'll read it again. We exist solely for this, to be the place he has chosen for his presence, his manifestation in the world, his epiphany. So much of the ascetical and mystical theology that I was brought up on and I think permeated the Christian churches generally, focused not on God, not on our being caught up in the gravitational pull of love in God, but on what we must do. I think one of the great travesties of the Christian message was moralism. We saw Jesus primarily as a moral teacher. You go to the Bible, it's a moral map. It's very tempting because it's easy, especially if you've got to teach people how to behave. 
if you start with behaviour and trying to get the behaviour right I think you missed the point Jesus was about mode of being so that you become the place where God loves the world into freedom here's a little test you can apply to yourself when you catch yourself being kind or forgiving or gentle or generous or compassionate listen for your first unedited reaction is it one of satisfaction or gratitude if your unedited reaction is one of satisfaction watch out you're on the wrong path it's about me I'm in control aren't I wonderful that I'm so kind <laughs> I'm being a little bit cardboard cut out teach here but what about if when you caught yourself being compassionate or kind you said oh my god isn't that marvelous thanks be to God isn't it wonderful to have a front row seat on God loving the world into freedom this is good stuff I want more of it it's exciting it's joyful it's liberating satisfied virtue spare us simply in the ground of life Merton never gives definitions of solitude or mysticism or anything else really he's not a systematic writer as Colin has pointed out to us that's not his way <coughs> however he does leave us enough clues to build a good picture of what he had in mind in these two concepts at the heart of Merton's experience of solitude is the process of facing what he alone could and must face and submitting to the truth that in turn faced him I think that's a pretty good description of solitude anyway it's about facing and in the tradition of Benedict that's basically listening listening with the ear of the heart and avoiding nothing Merton was ruthless he said to his friend Jim Forrest when uh, it was possible that people would find out about the affair that he'd had with Margie Smith and he said to Jim Forrest tell them everything tell them everything because I don't want them to get an idealized picture or sense of who I am Richard Raw commented once he said I pray for at least one humiliation every day <laughs> clearly geography and the presence of others are relevant to solitude but the facing and the submitting seem to me to be the heart of the matter from Merton and getting back to the young people again this is connecting with yourself I think the training I got in the seminary disconnected me for maintain the disconnection that I brought to the seminary um, we weren't taught to listen to ourselves and even now it's not a culture that encourages that there are ways I we use sister Mari's here with me and we teach a course in spirituality and we use Eugene Gendelin's book focusing um, I think it's an excellent way of listening to yourself respectfully and uh, effectively without digging <coughs> don't go digging but to face what's actually going on in his experience of mysticism is the lived awareness and I stress that expression the lived awareness of unity Merton knew and it became more a matter of emphasis for him in his latter years that to be is to be with to be part of like John Donne's poem everybody's part of the main life is fundamentally one in that handout I make a distinction between spirituality and religion briefly I think of spirituality and I think it's a good way to think about it in the light of not only the Christian tradition but other traditions spirituality is living relationships with the absolute however you name the absolute with yourself with other people 
and with the world at large. Living relationships. That to me is an expression of what is most central to being human. We are constituted in our humanity through those manners of relationship, for better and worse. Now, if we live that way, that leads, as it were, naturally to a concretization of the relationships in symbols and rituals and creedal formula and authority structures and customs, etc., etc. That's religion. Religion disconnected from spirituality is a menace. Worse than a menace, sometimes it is profoundly dangerous. How people in the name of religion, and I think of the burning of heretics and the crusades and so forth, how in the name of religion we have been able to do, we human beings, to do what we've done, is just, it just beggars belief disconnected from spirituality, from the living relationships, religion actually degenerates into another ideology. And beware of the ideologue who's got God on their side. You don't find much unity if you stay at the level of religion. You only find... And you don't have to ban abandon religion, and I'll come to this point in a moment. You don't have to abandon religion. In fact, I suggest you don't. But it's at the level of spirituality and relationships. We can experience a profound unity. No matter what the other believes, no matter what customs or rituals they have or how they dress themselves. In his experience of mysticism is the lived awareness of unity. Mysticism is available to all and is born of true solitude. This is one of the great paradoxes that Merton embodies and that Pauline mentioned in her own experience. Coming home to myself, I come home to you. Those of us who studied in the personal psychological tradition in the early 60s will remember one of the axioms. The more personal, the more universal. The more superficial I become, the more tied up in the fictions, the human fictions of society and culture, the more disparate we become, the more disconnected. The source and centre of life we carry within us, the seeds of contemplation. In 1966, in an article published in Commonweal, Merton writes, The way to find the real world is not merely to measure and observe what is outside us, but to discover our own inner ground. The best basis for my relationship with you is me, the real me. Not the pseudo me, not the false me, but the one that fits, the misfitted me. The me that knows that being is beyond me, that I exist as part of something much bigger. For that is where the world is, first of all, in my deepest self. I think there's tremendous wisdom in that. This is not about being introspective or egocentric. It's the very opposite, actually. The unexplored and perhaps feared hinterland of my own inner world, the other that dwells within me and is actually part of me, must be faced and discovered for what they are, my unique experience of a shared humanity. This is the path to true compassion and communion. We discover through the facing and the submitting of solitude that we are already one, as Merton says. True solitude, as Merton understood it, necessarily leads into mysticism, the lived awareness that we are one with all in the one. There is for Merton a constant movement within in order to move out. Those movements are of a piece, precisely because of the fact that we are already one. But Merton is clear about the primacy of solitude in our journey towards the world. Our real journey, he wrote in 1967, I think it was. No, 68, just before he went overseas. Our real journey in life is interior. It is a matter of growth, deepening and of an ever greater surrender to the creative action of love and grace in our hearts. 
Reflect on your own experience. Someone who's hollow, an individual who doesn't have much depth, someone who's not at home with themselves, you don't feel terribly at ease with them. But somebody whom you sense has got depth, someone whom you sense is at home with themselves, you feel more at ease with them. There's a connection. There is William Shannon, a lovely man. I met him in 2003 when I was I visited him in Rochester. I don't believe he ever met Merton, but he became one of the truly wonderful Merton scholars. He says, there was that inner geography he, Merton, could not cease from exploring, the interior journey that he had to get on with. And that is a journey that is always full of surprises. Little did he realize when he spoke his exuberant farewell to the world that that interior journey would bring him back once again into the world he thought he had forsaken. For his solitude had issued into what all true solitude must become, compassion. One of the reflections Merton's novices will share about Merton is when you were with him, you were the only one that existed. And he would have sometimes had as many as 30, 35 novices to see weekly. He had a way of connecting with people that was real. It wasn't a phony sort of learned counseling skill. It was a genuine love for people. When Merton went to the monastery in December 1941, he brought with him some idealized perceptions of what his life was going to be like quote, enclosed in the four walls, walls of my new freedom. The deepening experience of solitude not only helped him to begin to re emerge from his idealizations, including idealizations about solitude, it opened rich horizons of human growth that had been buried under those idealizations, that desire to fit in an essay written at the end of October 1966 entitled Love and Solitude, he writes, Is it true to say that one goes into solitude to get at the root of existence? It would be better simply to say that in solitude one is at the root. Those who are alone and are conscious of what their solitude means find themselves simply in the ground of life. They are in love. They are in love with all, with everyone, with everything. The very ground of ordinary life. Merton goes on to make another important point here linking both solitude and mysticism with ordinary existence. Solitude is not withdrawal, he says, from ordinary life. It's, it is not apart from, above, better than ordinary life. On the contrary, solitude is the very ground of ordinary life. It is the very ground of that simple, unpretentious, fully human activity by which we quietly earn our daily living and share our experiences with a few intimate friends. Can you think of anybody in your experience about whom you would say, I wish they would face up to? Fill in the gaps. Do they realize that solitude is the facing and the submitting to the truth? It's transforming. It's unifying. Merton urges us to take steps to become aware of this truth. He writes, we must learn to know and accept this ground of our being. Perhaps mindful of his own early life, he laments the fact that most people never awaken to this truth and therefore never experience the rich possibilities. He writes, to most people, though it is always there, it is unthinkable and unknown. Consequently, their life has no center and no foundation. It is dispersed in a pretense of togetherness in which there is no real meaning. Only when our activity proceeds out of the ground in which we have consented to be dissolved 
does it have the divine fruitfulness of love and grace. Only then does it really reach others in true communion. Often our need for others is not love at all, but only the need to be sustained in our illusions, even as we sustain others in theirs. But when we have re renounced these illusions, then we can certainly go out to others in true compassion. It is in solitude that illusions finally dissolve. Brief digression here. There's a wonderful book which I would recommend, written by Anne Mann. You may have heard her interviewed recently on radio, called The Life of I. And she talks about the growth of narcissism in Western societies. And one of the central traits of narcissism is a loss of empathy, which is another way of saying a loss of connectedness. If I'm not connected with you, I can't care about you. I can dismiss you. It doesn't quite much matter what happens to you. I've been reading that recently and I reviewed it for the National Council of Priests journal, The Swag, and when I thought deeply about it, a rather challenging thought came to me. I wonder in terms of us priests, and here I'm talking about Roman Catholic clergy, how much of the culture around priesthood actually is fertile ground for narcissism? I think clericalism is definitely ground for narcissism. But, so that thought, thank you Anne Mann, wife of Robert, academic from La Trobe University, thank you for that haunting challenge. He, Merton writes, we must, uh, we must work hard to see that they do not reshape themselves, these illusions, in some worse form, peopling our solitude with devils disguised as angels of light. Love, simplicity and compassion protect us against this. He who is truly alone finds in himself the heart of compassion with which to love not only this person or that, but all people. He sees them all in the one who is the word of God, the perfect manifestation of God's love, Jesus Christ. Nobody there panic. There are some who reject the idea that Merton still has anything of value to teach us. For example, Jim Forrest writes in an afterword to his biography of Merton, In 2005, Bishop Donald Whirl of Pittsburgh, chairman of a committee responsible for a new American Catholic catechism aimed especially at young adults, decided that a profile of Merton should be struck from the draft text. The Catechism was to include a profile in every chapter of an exemplary American Catholic, each entry giving an idea of the unexpected paths faith can open in one's life. In brackets, in the book as published, the section on prayer is the only one missing a profile. One of the reasons given by the Bishop for the removal of the Merton profile from the text was, quote, that the generation we were speaking to had no idea who he was. <laughs> Another factor he said was that, quote, we don't know all the details of the searching at the end of his life. Neither of the bishop's comments seems cogent to me. If Merton in his life and teaching is worth getting to know, and if the generation we were speaking to had no idea who he was, then we should address their ignorance, not strike Merton from the record. With regards to the details of the searching at the end of his life, we actually know a lot more than we know of many other guides in the faith tradition. Brother Patrick Hart, for example, recalls some of Merton's correspondence from Asia just days before his, his death. Patrick Hart writes, In one of the earliest letters I received from him, that is Merton, after his departure, he referred to some rumours which had already reached him. Quote, 
Give my regards to all the gang and I hope there are not too many crazy rumours. Keep telling everyone that I'm a monk of Gethsemane and intend to remain one all my days. Later in a letter, continues Patrick Hart, from New Delhi, dated November 9, 1968, just a month before his death, Thomas Merton wrote in part, quote, I hope I can bring back to my monastery something of the Asian wisdom with which I am fortunate to be in contact. It's clear from people who knew Merton, like Brother Patrick Hart, and I met one of the other brothers there who was adamant Merton was going nowhere else. It was either heaven or Gethsemane. <laughs> As it turned out, it was the former. One of Merton's many writing projects in the early 60s was to take some existing translations of the classic sayings of Chuang Tzu and present them in his own personal versions. There he records the story of a disciple who complains to the master Kung San, however hard I try, Dao is only a word in my ear. It does not ring any bells inside. Kung San sends the disciple to see Lao Tzu. The disciple got some supplies, traveled seven days and seven nights alone and came to Lao Tzu. Lao asked, do you come from Kung? Yes, replied the student. Who are all these people you brought with you? <coughs> the disciple whirled around to look. Nobody there. Panic. <laughs> a feature of life in the beginning of the second millennium is a marked sense of disconnection from the past. This is epitomized and accentuated every time adults have to get their preschool children to work the computer or the mobile phone for them. In the eyes of many, especially the young, the pre-digital world does not seem to hold much relevance. That, it seems to me, is a very dangerous assumption. We are historical beings. As Lao Tzu suggests, we bring a whole lot of people with us into the present and that can be destructive if we are not aware of their presence and their influence. Remembering well, honouring those people and critiquing them as appropriate is essential to our identity and our sanity. Remembering well is also an essential part of begetting the future well. This is especially true for those of us who believe the promise, I shall be with you. That promise is expressed in and through many people and events in history. We can see it and hear it in Thomas Merton. His life and writings bear witness to Pope Paul VI words, through the Holy Spirit, the gospel penetrates to the heart of the world for it is the spirit who causes people to discern the time, signs of the times, signs willed by God, which evangelization reveals and puts to use within history. This I would call communion. Our being baptized into Christ places our lives on an ultimate footing. All that is instrumental and relative finds its true meaning in the context of the ultimate. We could say it another way. The more we are experientially identified with Jesus Christ, the more we will find ourselves inclined to put the prefix trans in front of our various structures and institutions. So we will become trans-historical, trans-cultural, trans-political, trans-ethnic, trans-societal, yes, even trans-religious. This is not to say that we cease to be beings that are historical and cultural and ethnic and so on. Far from it. It is to recognize that every socially divined nomos is an area of meaning carved out of a vast mass of meaninglessness. And I'm quoting Peter Berger there. Human beings need to fabricate social structures and institutions in the face of the incomprehensible and uncontrollable mystery that is existence. We make up a life within which 
we can engage existence. Those social structures and institutions are not ultimate. They are means, not ends. They are necessary fictions that enable us to remain somewhat sane as we turn up for daily life. These means serve us well when they enable us to encounter the mystery. They serve us badly and can be death-dealing when they become ends instead of means and block our way to the mystery. The Christian finds his or her identity and security in Christ. This is the tragedy of trying to fit into social fictions whether it's a culture or an ethnic group or a political group and you put your, invest your energy and your time and you, that's your identity. Wrong. Wrong. That is a place in the world from which you are called to encounter the mystery beyond those fictions. The Christian does not reject history or culture or politics or any other necessary human fiction. The Christian engages these fictions intelligently and compassionately as a liberated individual. Through the Christian, the kingdom transforms the human reality from top to bottom, from the depth dimension to the most superficial facts. St. Paul reminds the community in Galatia of this. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. Dorothy Day in 1943 wrote a piece which was published in the United States and got her into no end of trouble. She said, the doctrine of the mystical body of Christ changes everything. Those Germans we are killing are our brothers and sisters. Those Japanese are our brothers and sisters. Of course, that didn't go down well in a society geared to war against those people. This was the reason why Thomas Merton was a, a dedicated pacifist. Now, some of his reasons and things he wrote on it were not always terribly coherent. But you can see, if you really get to the bottom of what baptism means, being one in Christ, pretty hard to go out and kill people. On his way to Bangkok in October 1968, Merton was scheduled to give a talk to representatives of ten world religions in Calcutta. It was part of a four-day conference for discussion and dialogue under the theme, The Relevance of Religion in the Modern World. Merton wrote substantial notes for that presentation, but in fact gave an informal talk instead. The text of the substantial notes are available in the book published the Asian Journal of Thomas Merton and the text of the informal talk. In the notes for the presentation, Merton writes specifically of communication between monks of varying traditions, but in fact speaks to... Uh, he's writing for monks, but he in fact speaks to and of us all. He writes... The monk must be wide open to life and to new experience because he has fully utilized his own tradition and gone beyond it. This will permit him to meet a discipline of another, apparently remote and alien tradition, and find a common ground of verbal understanding with the other. The post-verbal level will then at least ideally be that on which they both meet beyond their own words and their own understanding in the silence of an ultimate experience which might conceivably not have occurred if they had not met and spoken. This I would call communion. I think it is something that the deepest ground of our being cries out for and it is something for which a lifetime of striving would not be enough. I put a footnote in here with reference to Merton's mentioning the post-verbal. In one of his journal entries, um, oh, 
Merton wrote, what is best is what is not said. Merton is here recalling a comment made to him by the Sufi mystic Sidi Abdeslam in a letter of February the 14th, 1967. That idea is not entirely new to Merton. In a journal entry on December the 4th, 1940, before he went to the monastery, he reflects on poetry and the writings of St. Bonaventure and speaks of keeping hid that which cannot be told. Our secular culture and indeed the theological culture that we've inherited wants to define and say everything that can be said. And really what matters most can't be said. I think that's a piece of wisdom that we would do well to take to heart. With regard to what Merton has said here about this I would call communion, is this not prophetic? Does it not call us back to the essence of the gospel and the kingdom? Does it not challenge us to reflect on the prejudices that we all carry in our hearts, the bigotries that tear communities apart, the selfishness, fear and vanity that lead us into conflict with each other? Does it not remind us that what matters in the end is not the fictions, religious or other, we have devised to shield us from overexposure to the mystery, but the mystery itself? Not survival, but prophecy. There is no doubt in my mind that Merton's whole life was prophetic, and his writings reflect this repeatedly. When the eminent Benedictine historian Jean Leclerc invited Merton to speak on Marxism at the Bangkok conference in 1968, Merton wrote to Leclerc, the vocation of the monk in the modern world, especially Marxist, and Merton was inclined in this time to compare Marxism with monasticism. Well, very serious, it was a very serious reflection and I think it was uh, an insight in it. The vocation of the monk in the modern world, especially Marxist, is not survival but prophecy. Christian churches would do well to hear that. It's not about survival, it's about prophecy. Jean Leclerc believed that Merton went with prophetic monks like St. Jerome, St. Peter Damien and St. Bernard in monastic history. He quotes Merton himself. One thing is certain, if the contemplative, the monk, the priest, the poet merely forsake their vestiges of wisdom and join in the triumphant empty-handed crowing of advertising men and engineers of opinion, then there's nothing left in store for us but total madness. In December 1967, Merton gave a retreat to a group of contemplative nuns at Gethsemane. What he says in that conference nearly 50 years ago is as fresh and relevant now as it was then. He writes, or he said, presence is what counts. It's important to realize that the church itself is presence. And so is the contemplative life. Community is presence, not an institution. We've been banking on the ability to substitute institution for the reality of presence, and it simply won't work. Later in the same conference, he speaks of the importance of silence in giving words whatever witness value they might have. To come to a place where silence exists, to realize there are people who are content to listen and to live in silence, impresses people today who are not at all impressed by mere words. It isn't that words or preaching are bad, it is just that people don't want to hear any more words. In our mechanical age all words have become alike. They've all been reduced to the level of the commercial. To say God is love is like saying eat Wheaties. <laughs> I come to the last word, sorry to have been so long here. I have only begun to seek the questions. In 1967, Pope Paul VI wrote to Dom Francis de Croix, abbot of the Cistercian Monastery of Fratacci near Rome, requesting him to consult with his order and develop 
quote, a message of contemplatives to the world. Dom Francis, in a letter of August the 14th, 1967, to Merton, requested a statement of his thoughts by the end of the month. Merton wrote his statement on August the 21st, the very day he received the abbot's letter, but in typical Merton style, before he posted that letter, he wrote a second letter and sent them together on August the 22nd as his response. They come down to us as a letter on the contemplative life. And I conclude with some words from that letter of Merton's response to Dom Francis. It's something of a farewell statement from Merton. Can I tell you that I have found answers to the questions that torment the people of our time? I do not know if I have found answers. When I first became a monk, yes, I was more sure of answers. But as I grow old in the monastic life and advance further into solitude, I become aware that I have only begun to seek the questions. My brothers and sisters, perhaps in my solitude, I have become, as it were, an explorer for you. I have been summoned to explore a desert area of the human heart in which explanations no longer suffice and in which one learns that only experience counts. An arid, rocky, dark land of the soul, sometimes illuminated by strange fires which we fear and peopled by spectres which we studiously avoid except in our nightmares. And in this area I have learned that one cannot truly know hope unless one has found out how like despair hope is. The language of Christianity has said this for centuries in other less naked terms. But the language of Christianity has been so used and so misused that sometimes you distrust it. You do not know whether or not behind the word cross there stands the experience of mercy and salvation or only the threat of punishment. If my word means anything to you, I can say to you that I have experienced the cross to mean mercy and not cruelty, truth, not, not deception, that the news of the truth and love of Jesus is indeed the true good news, but in our time it speaks out in strange places. And perhaps it speaks out in you more than it does in me. Perhaps Christ is nearer to you than he is to me. This I say without shame or guilt because I have learned to rejoice that Jesus is in the world, in people who know him not, that he is at work in them when they think themselves far from him. And it is my joy to tell you to hope, though you think that for you, of all people, hope is impossible. Hope not because you think you can be good, but because God loves us, irrespective of our merits, and whatever is good in us comes from his love, not from our own doing. Hope because Jesus is with those who are poor and outcast, and perhaps despised even by those who should seek them and care for them more lovingly because they act in God's name. No one on earth has reason to despair of Jesus because Jesus loves people, loves them in their sin and we too must love people in their sin. Thank you very much. Authentic Christian Witness and you may look at it from, of course, that's another thing that I think we have to take into account. Is everybody, God now, I understand, is a big problem. So, well, that's fine. Uh, I don't think he's really that much of a problem. But I mean, people are making a great problem out of God. I mean, there's a, people are writing books saying that modern man simply has no concept of what God is. We don't have to have a concept of God. It's a matter of concepts. It's just a question of being spontaneously open to the idea of God. I mean, a person may have no idea of God, whatever, and be completely hit rock between the eyes by grace. It isn't a question of ideas. But anyway, let me just read this one last quote here, which I think is quite good, and we'll, uh, then we can sort of 
perhaps go for a walk, or perhaps just talk a little bit here and then go for a walk. Uh, a mechanized world looks at silence and secrecy as a void, as a nothingness that cannot be measured in statistical terms. Such a world regards the lack of technological noise and verifiable quantities as a betrayal of scientific omnipotence. Limitation of knowledge is viewed as shameful or as a motive for new research only. Yeah, the modern man cannot live with the unknown. In this context, his research has taken on a terrible prejudice aspect, embodying immodesty and lack of reserve. He forgets that at the end of his research, a new and vaster unknown will open up. Unless this is what we're prying into private life, which is going on to a great extent now. The study of silence. The idea of dignity and reserve has acquired a new meaning in an age when psychology can become coercive in its politics. See, this is the, because we're entering a world now, in, in the electronic world which we are now entering, uh, it's possible that a person may have no privacy, whatever. They can, the, the things they can do now are fantastic. I mean, they can put devices in your place to pick up every sound and so forth. And you have no notion that they're there. You never see anybody put it there. They could shoot a microphone around here, uh, stick it with a rifle from, from 100 yards away, stick it onto a piece of part of the window there, and you've got a microphone picking up everything. You don't need any wires or anything. It's picking everything up. So, but anyway, uh, I am pleading against reductionism in silence, against the bypassing of specific values that comes to the fore in our esteem for the unique individual and his right to claim to a many-voiced silence. I think that's pretty good for us, don't you? Mm -hmm. So the, the individual's right to claim to a many-voiced silence, I mean, to, to, to hear not only on the level of grace, but I mean also on the level of nature, you know. I mean, uh, one of the great things about the place where I live I don't know if I'll be able to show it to you or not, I'm not sure. I don't know if that. That's the top. But it's, it's got big pine trees on it. And it's got a flat roof. And at night, the wind's in these pine trees, and maybe the rain's coming down on the roof. And I tell you, it's just perfect. I mean, this is, this is what you need. Now about that famous question. What about that? What do you all think? Had a lot of fun with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what would you do? Supposing, let's, let's make it even. Supposing that the church, uh, the whole world goes communist. And the church says, yep, the commies are right. Had the right idea all along. This is real community. See, this, is a, this is a real modern outlook. They've got the answer to the modern man. And so, no more contemplative life. Close down, I mean, the active life, fine, but contemplative life. Finished. And the church says it, the commies say it, the government says it, so forth. Then what do you do? Well, right away it becomes an individual problem. Yeah. Well, but can it be a, a, a community thing, too? I guess it is. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, you could walk off. Well, you, you, the, the, what would you do? Well, what, what would you do with your butt? With my butt? You're your bunch. You're your group. Oh, my bunch. Uh, <laughs> other business for a month. <laughs> or something. Why well, I don't know about it. You said you had to do the best you could. And yeah. Especially, uh, see that uh, the age of being young. Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, of course, what, 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 what have your people done in foreign countries? In China, I know what our, our group did. And in Peking, well, they went to Peking and ran a dairy. I don't know. And they were the monks. They were about the remains of the community, about 12 of them, I guess, ran a dairy. I don't know what's what became of them now. I haven't heard anything about it for the last few years. But they had a, you know, they got a little business going. And they worked in it together. Mm -hmm. See, the interest of something like that is that that's really what a lot of the monastic reform people are doing anyway. They will go off into Chicago or somewhere and, and get something like that. Or they're just four or five guys who live together and take jobs. What you could do, for example, with the community you've got the old infirm, move into a, a place somewhere, preferably a farm, I'd say. But you move in, and some work, and the others are taken care of. And I think we see the difference. Yeah, sure. See, you know, and the, the interest of that is that you really don't need a lot of the things. 
that we worry about in order to function as a, as a contemporary. Okay. Yeah, it might be easier. Uh, any, uh, anybody else got any? What would, what, would, what would you do? Supposing tomorrow, the whole thing is that they closed down Allegheny. You, the, you had the choice, either be an active nun or quit. Well, Pat, you know, we talked about it. Yeah. And uh, we didn't know whether there would be the provision for us to start up again. But if there were, you know, and well, if we could, we would. But you couldn't start up again legally, that'd be a thing. That's and right. as a, as well, a legal the legal aspect, yeah. you know, is yeah, the right. That's the point, yeah. <laughs> it's not important. Yeah. Yeah. And that uh, we were talking, that if we really thought the community was that it's important in itself, yeah. Uh, for its own ends, not just the support of us. We talked to you this morning. Uh, the community in itself mm -hmm. is important. Yeah, sure. Sure. And uh, therefore, for the theological yeah. witness, sure. uh, we would stay together for some time. Sure. Silence, so. And that would even mean if even if nobody knew you were a community. Right. There wouldn't have to be any signs that you were a community. Mm -hmm. uh, our general told us a real nice story. I thought this is more a real visible sign. But these are the little brother, little sisters, Charles of Foucault. Yes. This was in Japan. This was some port city in Japan somewhere. And they were living, I guess, uh, on a, one of these poor sections that's out over the bay, you know, on wooden stakes and so forth. And these three little sisters were living in this place. Of course, they got the best of sacrament wherever they are. And they had this Blessed Sacrament lamp, you know, this tabernacle light burning in their apartment all the time. But second, these Japanese people, who were none of the Christian, came in and said, Now look, this is a fire hazard. So you've got this light burning all the time. And I, I, I'm afraid I, don't, I can't tell this story really as it should be told because I can't remember the ins and outs of it. But it goes like this the, the nuns explain what they're doing, that they're praying. And then this is like prayer, and this life is part of like prayer. But then the people say, oh, fine, good, all right, well, we understand. Then something comes up that for some reason, or I can't remember, they had to, they had to, uh, they couldn't be there or something, and they had to be without the best sack when the, when the light was out. And then the Japanese said, well, what's the matter? What's, what's the, the lights out? What's going on? You should be praying. So then they explained, look, for some, this is the part that I don't remember, for some reason or other, they couldn't be there, and the place had to be left alone. And, they, and so the Japanese, it ends up with the Japanese people saying, all right, then we'll be there. <laughs> See? And just so that you can have the light burning with someone, someone about, no, someone of us will take your job, and then you stay there. And so one of the Japanese people, went to work for this uh, at her job, and then she uh, was able to be there when it was necessary. But uh, anybody, anybody else? Anybody? That was the witness. Yes. Oh, um, Father, it seems that you're emphasizing here the institutional deal of it, uh, doing away with the institutional Well, deal. I'm not doing away with it, but... Well, I mean, according to uh, the question here, yeah. if it's forbidden, therefore... Yeah. yeah. Um, you can't do it. For instance, now, say we're all one community, and yeah. uh, this happened. You yeah. know, came into the law, and they could say, okay, now this is it, you can't be mm. You can't continue anymore. Yeah. You couldn't say to any of us, you can't be contemplative anymore. No. You are a contemplative. Exactly. You can't turn That's it right. off. That's right. No matter where we go, exactly. one person on an island, we remain a contemplative, all exactly. united in one. That's the thing. And yeah. so it couldn't end. That's right. That's right. Only the material problem. That's right. Yeah, that's the that's that's really the point of the question. And so yeah. all these people who answered, our young ones that all wanted it, said, "I will continue the same life." Exactly. Yeah. Because yeah. they're not going to turn something off that's already yeah, exactly. there. Yeah, that's the thing. So, you know that that's the, the that that's the answer, and that shows see, that shows exactly what we want to know. That we really need business in this thing. See, we're in it for what for what counts. And i this is something I've never doubted for a minute. Now, that we all know what we're here for. And the reason, this is not our credit, it's God's gift. The gift of God given to us in our vocation is something very real and very serious. And it's the most real, most serious thing that's ever happened to any of us. And this is what we know. And see, this is being attacked on all sides. Everybody is, people are trying to say it's not real, it's not serious. You don't have to worry about that for 10 seconds. We know it's real. You don't have to defend anything. And, see, we don't have to worry 
at all about a renewal which consists in a lot of flim flam that we're not interested in. So the thing, the, 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 the key thing that I would say, that what we, we're getting to good and fast, which is right, we're getting down to the basic thing in our vocation, which is our liberty as children of God. We have been called to seek God with freedom and to respond to Him freely, and nobody's going to stop us. Who's going to stop us? You know, take that wonderful phrase at the end of Romans 8. Who shall separate us from the charity of Christ? And you see, that's one of the points of getting together here. When we're by ourselves, when we're on our own, and when everything is getting real, you know, things are really upside down and so forth, we, we may sort of wonder, you know, are, are we crazy? See? But we're not. And all we need to do is to get together and see. I mean, that here we are. And we know very well, we're, we're all in, the, in this together, and we know what we're looking for. See? And we know that it's real. And there's no real, there's no problem. The other thing to do is to to make sure that the real things are the ones that are emphasized. That's what we want to do. So it could take many forms. I sure. mean, actually, the way yeah. it would be this. Yeah. And you see, there are all sorts of possibilities. That we have always kind of trained ourselves to think that it has to be this one little way and this one little way. And, and as if all these differences between orders. So abolish all the things between orders. Who cares? Except keep those pretty habits. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but really, I mean, uh, what difference does it make whether whether we're Franciscans or Carmelites or anything like that? I mean, we all have a, a, a terrific tradition, and it's fine. But we could all be members of the same same thing if we did. We had to. Yeah, we would just be Christians. <laughs> and and uh, I think we're going to come to this kind of a, of a pluralistic view of the thing. See, the, I think a lot of our renewal is going to be not just a question of, of sort of joining ranks and being much more Carmelite and much more Franciscan and much more Cistercian and so forth, but to see uh, how much Franciscanism there is here. It's a very Franciscan place in its own way. That was a funny thing that had when I, when I, one of my big moments of struggle when I was worrying about getting in here. Well, should I enter? Should I enter? Uh, I was walking around the back of that. It was on Good Friday and had, a, had been a real pressured day. I was on, on retreat. I wasn't in the community. And it had been a real heavy day. Good Friday was terrific in the old days. And everything was in the morning. And, uh, and I was sort of just exhausted in the afternoon. I was going for a walk back of the building and saying, I couldn't stand this place. So this is, wow. I'm a Franciscan. I need nature. <laughs> And uh, it's, it's very funny because the point where I was saying that to myself is precisely the point that I cross every day when I go from there to the monastery. <laughs> <laughs> God is saying, listen, you go. <laughs> Who do you trust? You know, because I've got more nature here than I would have got in any other. I mean, if I were a Franciscan, I'd been in Patterson. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. yeah. <laughs> Can any of you ever get out into nature? We have, we have 98, over 98 or so. Where are you, sister? We're in East Texas, Buffalo, oh. Texas. Oh, yeah. And hey, we, excuse me. Yes, sir. Are you uh, anywhere near our hermit down there? We've got a... Yes, Father, we're about 60 miles from Oh, do you know him? Have you seen him? Well, Father, we uh, supply with all the brands. Oh, wow. Well, you know. Yes. He was next to me in the Novishka, you know. He's the next man above me in choir. Yes. Yeah. You haven't seen him at all? Well, Father, uh, yes, I have. Have you been out there? No. You don't get out there. Well, it's, it's kind of confidential to keep the monastery. Oh, fine. I stop by there when they. Well, you uh, should. I tried to persuade him that, that was an ideal place in the woods there. <laughs> <laughs> You've got woods uh, back of your place. Yes. Uh, and within your enclosure? Yes. Oh, fine. Yes. Well, that's fine. Anybody else? How, how are you? You're, you're just. Uh, you're just she has a home. postage stamp for a guy. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Father will break up yet. Yeah, well, you should. Because we could go back. What you need to do is get up. I mean, those hills up there are fantastic. Oh, yes. You can just put, put, get yourself a cabin up on top of the hill there. And, you know, three or three four people could be there a long time or something. Just go up there for, for a week at a time, make these yes. short retreats or something. The only trouble is if you've got a little place somewhere, you really need to be there all the time because otherwise people will come and wreck it. So you have to, you know, you have to go on as permanently there. But I think every, every community should have a retreat place out in nature somewhere if you can. Of course, if you're in town, it's, it's pretty tough. 
But if you're in the suburbs and so forth, it's, because I mean, it's so, uh, that's one reason why I want to take you all out for a walk this afternoon yes. and uh, show you one of these lakes we've got down here. Mm -hmm. You've got all these artificial lakes all over the place. That, mm -hmm. They're not exactly very beautiful, but it's water. Yeah. Well, what is your setup? Just sort of a, what, what's your order, by the way? I don't know if you guys would have it. <laughs> this is new poor player habit, huh? Or well, it's one that it's our old one cut down. <laughs> oh, I see. Well, you're, you're the poor players at uh, where? New Orleans. New Orleans, I see, I see. Well, you've been up here before. You know our habit, don't you? Yes. Oh, well, good. I thought you're, you're one. You, you're quite yeah. familiar with everything. Mm -hmm. And you're in uh, and New Orleans, you've got people below you, you said? Active sisters, what was this? Uh, well, we had a federation. Winona. Oh, Winona. Winona, you were talking about my See, um, I just, we brought our sisters up I see. here. We were starting this uh, place in service education yeah. information, which yeah. we never had. Yeah. And uh, it's on a campus, St. Teresa's College. But they can't go out of this building. Oh, they can go out in the yard, and there's a yard there. But here, all these monitors, and oh. they go ahead. Well, he has a right to say, go ahead. Yeah, but you have but no right to We haven't any right to do it. Uh, so yeah. Well, can't he let you out? It has to go yes, wrong. Yes, he could. But you see, uh, we can't. We're taking these people from all the houses. The abbots yeah. are letting them into our care, them into our care. And with the big deal of enclosure, you know, that they're not going to break it in any way. Oh. I understand. Mm -hmm. In other words, you are, is this a, a sort of a specially contemplative Just project to begin with? Yes. Mm -hmm. I see. And so therefore it has to have its closed in. You see, there, there again, you run into that right away. You, see. you want to do something, and then the way it is set up it prevents you from doing what you really want to do. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of obstacle that we're really up against. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of thing. There, there, those are our real problems We're on a level like that. And there, what do you do with things like that? You've got so many people saying, and I guess this isn't practical for us, I think we're pretty much committed to the institution, all of us here, really. I mean, it's as scary as you are, anyway. <laughs> and uh, I am in another way, too. I mean, uh, for all sorts of various reasons, I'm, I'm absolutely committed to get something that I couldn't possibly go somewhere else and start some crazy thing on my own. So, but I mean, what a lot of people will do, and perhaps rightly, will be to say, all right, leave the order and start over. But we can't do that. What we're going to do, what we have to do, is to do it from within the order. And I think that, I think we're all agreed on that. See, there may be younger ones that may want to do these other things and start up. But how hazardous that is. See, it's not as easy as it looks. Mm -hmm. And you've all had experience with these people that come along with something that looks good, and then they take off in the last, you know, three weeks. There have been so many people in, in our house. I mean, I don't know how long that... You, you may get the... It's fine. It's yeah. fine. You may, you may take that over. Might be a, I don't know where... Where do they come from? That I think New York, isn't it? I don't know. That was New York. Right, well, they are the ones... The, 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 they are the ones that come from Father Walter's monastery. Mm -hmm. And they are the ones that cause the trouble. Mm -hmm. Actually. Mm -hmm. See? And... Uh, I know them, I don't think they, they probably don't have an awful good chance of making out. Mm -hmm. I don't, I, so you, you keep, keep an option. It's a beautiful place. Well, that'd be the answer for you. But in, just in regard to what you're saying there, of starting new, we discussed that this morning. Say all of us would say, great, let's start a new place. You know, with these ideas. Before you know it, one thing leads to another, and the stretch is going to build right up again. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Forever. Yeah. 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 Well, my own particular view of the thing is I am not going to get involved in any new departures. I mean, not that I don't like them and so forth, but I, I just feel my own particular vocation, obviously, I'm trying to get seven. And there's no point in trying to do anything that can't be done here for me. But, uh, I don't know, obviously here we're quite limited. There are certain things that you're just not going to be able to do. You've got a pretty good situation. Uh, you, you can do what you can see of it, you know. The, uh, the fact, for example, that people here can, anybody can get permission to go for, you can get permission to spend the day in the woods if you want. Right? It, without any difficulty, a person can get permission for the day off. Anybody. He can take his lunch, he can go out in the woods for the day. Uh, not everybody can get permission to live as a hermit, but anybody can get permission, could if they wanted to, to say several days in a hermitage outside. We haven't got one yet, but there will be one. And people will be able to go out for two or three days if they want to. 
Well, I mean, that's really something, you know, mm -hmm. to have have opportunities like that. And if people can't take advantage of that, well, what's the great problem? So many people are bugged by what seem to be problems of ideal and problems of conscience and so forth. I mean, for some reason or other, nobody, people can't rest satisfied with something that's, you know, that isn't absolutely airtight from all sides. Mm -hmm. And the fact that I've got permission to spend today in the woods, well, what about next week? Or is this is this the ideal of this assertion order? Or what is somebody going to think about it? Or something like that. You know, go up, they've got the day in the woods, they spend the whole day worrying about something, <laughs> some unreal problem. I'm more and more convinced that our great problem is taking advantage of what we've got. I mean, for us, I, I think we're all, we should all be agreed on that. And I think that perhaps what we can do in these next two or three days is sort of give one another boost and encouragement and so forth, so we'll really use what we've got. How did you let a um, woman go out and stay overnight out in the kitchen? Within well, you have to be within some kind of enclosure somewhere. Well, within an enclosure of seven foot high, is that permitted? Why not? We can go out and spend the well, whole day whenever we want. Why not spend the night? But we didn't know whether... Well, I don't see any canonical reason why Any canonical reason for it. You're inside your enclosure? Yes. And if you're in a place where nobody can get in... Nobody can. There's no question. It would just be a matter of rules. You have a question of... Uh, you might run into trouble with your own higher superiors, but I mean, it would just simply be whether they liked it or not. Well, we just have a bishop over in Cisco. We aren't in the fathers yet. Oh. <laughs> aren't, aren't you in a We're not kind of Meister, but we have a uh, learned the bishop in the same place. Oh, you're not in the, uh, going to be in the province of that? No, Father. Most uh, of the province of the United States aren't. Very, yeah, very few are. I didn't know that. <laughs> but uh, I think on those problems, you see problems that are just simply a matter of well, a higher spirit, I've, I've seen that change overnight. Yes. No, 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 we are not. Yeah. We're really, you're part of the Yeah. Is that true of all the Carmels? No, it no. is true in this country of the exception of four Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Louisville, are they in the same spot? Or? I think so. Yeah. The, the Father General gets the uh, Pope's permission to come in on the three times he's visited us in 35 years. And um, then uh, he comes just in a paternal way, oh. uh, no jurisdiction, whatever. Oh, gee, what are you people so worried about? Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> we had just heard that uh, women don't get to be hermits, and so we uh, find ourselves to go out during the daytime. Oh, you can certainly do it in your enclosure. There's no problem about that. There's no reason, I mean, there's no canonical reason at all why you, why you people shouldn't have a Laura, you know, that is separate cottages. Why not? You could. All you've got to do is do it. But what is this thing in New Hampshire that the Carmelites are doing? I don't know. It's going to be very long time. Four, three went from Concord, as I understand it. These nuns? Mm -hmm. Three nuns. And they took uh, exclaustration, so they yeah. have no uh, curtain yeah. out on exclaustration. Yeah. They live in the house of the father of one of the sisters. Oh. And um, one sister, I believe, from Boston or Boston. I don't know. Nice. They have a, they have a uh, constitution written up, but I don't know where it is. Well, that's, that's what everybody does. That's, that's the thing that beats me. Because people, I mean, this is nothing against them, but I mean, people do it here too. I mean, the first thing you do, you sit down and write a rule. See, before you even you stuck your yeah. nose out the window, you've got your rule. <laughs> How to live a hermit life. <laughs> but with, really, with all these things, again, I think that what what we should do is take advantage of what we can do within our own structure. Because mm -hmm. there may be much more we can do within our own structure than we realize. And uh, look at what, we've got three hermits here now, you know, and four or one coming up. Do you all know that our yes. is going to be a hermit? He's going to the car, he announced it yesterday. Mm -hmm. And he's got a hermit who's going up way over in the woods across the valley there, which is rather well, a rough section over there, too. So. It's uh, that's that's some moonshine area over there. <laughs> Not all together civilized. Although we have got a van here that works at the cow bar. He said the road runs past this place and go on that road, man, and no more civilization. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, uh, actually, I think that if you've got a, uh, an existing structure and get some kind of a solitude in that, then you can try it out. You see. And, 
the advantage of the kind of setup that I've got here is just fantastic because you don't have to do your own laundry. Uh, I, I only cook supper if I have to. I, I somehow like dinner, but that's all the cooking you have to do, just wash a couple of dishes, that's all. Uh, you don't have to go downtown to the store or anything like that. You don't have to run down, put money in the bank and, you know, have a bank account, all that sort of thing. You get all kinds of things from the monastery, real cheap. I mean, they buy food on wholesale sort of thing, and then you just get canned beans any time you want it. So mm -hmm. And uh, medicine right there, mm -hmm. infirmary, you go down to your allergy shots, they'll probably give you the shots. You don't have to give yourself your own shots. That's what you And it's just perfect. The only problem is that if, if I waste my time worrying about uh, is this the most perfect setup, you know, and I can say, well, I'm living like a rich man. Well, I am. I mean, I've got the luxury of solitude and silence, but it's too bad. It's not ideal. I mean, maybe, this, maybe I'm getting more than I'm entitled to, but I'm not going to hang on to it. <laughs> Do you take part in any of the liturgy anymore? I go to house celebration on feast days, maybe Sundays, some Sundays on feast days, once a week. And that's, uh, uh, well, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll fess up and tell you the awful truth. I'm just saying the old Latin mass with my remedy. Because I like the old, I'm sorry, I like the old Latin mass. And I say the old Latin office because I love it. Now, this, this is no, I'm not fighting anybody. I just, this is just what I grew up with. Well, why do we just change people so that you Sure, that, this is fine. This is great. I mean, I've got no objection to that but for myself. So well, that's I, what I mean. Yeah. Need to do I don't need it. I'm, I'm, I'm happy enough with it. Yeah. See, uh, we, we, even had, we didn't even have the new Psalter. I guess we still so don't. We had St. Jerome. And so I grew up in the bishop with all this business of St. Jerome's Latin and the commentary on the Psalms was completely off the had nothing to do with, <laughs> with anything. But I mean, it's St. Augustine is the best theology on the church, St. Augustine's commentary on the Psalms, nevertheless. It's got nothing to do with the Psalms, but that would have passed, really. That's just too much to say that. But really, you grow up with this, and everything. Uh, that's one of the things about breaking off and starting something new is you break all this continuity. The fact, for example, just the fact now the immaculate conception comes around with this kind of weather every year. You know, you can kind of feel it coming, and you begin to get your ad your Advent anaphones are running through your head, and the Advent hymn started two days ago. It's a beautiful melody, and so forth and so forth. And all this, it's all done for you. And you cut that all off, and you start over again, and you build something of your own. And you've just got to start from scratch, and most people can't do that. And that's why they fail. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they think they're going to start a whole new ideal thing over again. But you, you've got to do the work of, of 2,000 years mm -hmm. for yourself. And most of us just aren't in shape to do that. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it, it is good to see that we have behind us St. Teresa, John of the Cross, St. Francis, and, and, and St. Dominic and so forth and so forth, and we've got these traditions. And this is a great deal has been done for us. It's given us all silver platter. But, uh, see, people feel bad about taking something like that from They feel that it was wrong. Yeah, I don't think we should feel bad. We really owe it to our communities to work from within, you know, to That's try sure. to get these changes sure. that we need. Sure. Yeah. Sure. From within. I've seen so many people, I mean, just the other day, one of my novices, he was uh, a real good kid, had no trouble at all in the bishop, and a real good, solid kid. Okay, he was a little mature. I mean, he got so many like that. He came in at 18 or something, which was perhaps maybe too soon, I don't know. So, and he was having a tough time after profession, and he wanted to be a hermit. And everybody told him, obviously, well, listen, you're a little young yet, wait around, you know, and stick it out like the rest of us did, maybe you'll get it later on. No, he had to leave, and it wasn't right for him to stay, and, and he's got to, he, he really, he, he, got, he got a hold of this immature thing and worked it for all it was worth. See, that's the, he said, well, I, when I came, I was immature, <laughs> therefore I have to leave. So he, he was the one who was working this. Nobody else was pushing him out. He was working the immature thing for in his favor. So he left, and going to be a hermit somewhere, maybe with the Dominani in Canada. Two days ago, he got married. So, you know, I mean, it's just fine, it's all right. I mean, I hope he has a happy married life, but I mean, that's no way to be a hermit. <laughs> 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 I 
Yes. <laughs> one fellow was in the division with me in Don Walter, great big tall, six foot fellow. He went to Utah to our foundation and didn't like it there. So he had to go to Italy to come out of me, because the Camaldolese weren't in this country. He was in Camaldolese three days. And then trekked on back home and got married. So then you see that over and over and over again. Well, see, the, this, the hermit part of the thing, too, has to come from the community. Uh, that was one of the things that, that I was very happy about, the way it worked out for me. Everybody knew for years that I wanted to be a hermit. They thought, oh, he's crazy, he's a writer, he doesn't want to be a hermit, he just thinks he wants to be a hermit, so on and so on. But anyway, it went on and went on and went on, and finally, uh, Don James said, okay, great, go ahead. And then it was voted on by the uh, the Abbot's Council, and they were unanimous on the thing. And so I felt that really the community was behind it. And I think more or less they, as, as much as a community can be on a thing like that, they are just a lot of people saying, what's that guy doing up there? You know? <laughs> this doesn't do any work, so well, I think I worked hard to see what he did up there. But, you know, the kind of feeling that, that, that this is the feeling that you're getting out of something. And that, uh, but if the community is willing to let a person try that thing, then it's understood on all sides. Uh, that, that they are, they say, okay, we are willing to have you be a hermit. But I think that the, the hermit, in absolute justice, owes it to the community just to do his, to support himself. And I think the three of us more or less do. Uh, one of them works in the uh, dairy laboratory. He comes in in the morning, and uh, three mornings a week, tests the whole milk, does all the pasteurizing and all that. But he doesn't do all the pasteurizing, he does all the chemical lab work on milk and cheese. And he's a good man, he's a scientist, the former precious blood father. And he's a scientist who really knows his stuff and, and does a very good job. And the other one takes work out there. He does real simple work, but he does a good job. And I think if people understand, you know, that they will, it's a quid pro quo thing. I mean, you know, they will they will go so far, then you should do do your bit. And that's where you run into trouble with some hermits. I mean, you'll find that you're liable to get somebody who uh, thinks that his job as a hermit is just to come, and come back and, and judge everything that's going on in the community. <laughs> and so it seems to me that the only humble, simple thing, not the only thing, but for you and me, the kind of practical decision we can make is simply to live with what we've got. God has given us this, and maybe we don't deserve it, and, but I think that certain things do follow. I mean, I don't want to get into my own particular field of the peace movement and that sort of stuff, but I mean, we are not entitled to benefit by something like the Vietnam War. And, and I mean, that, that, that is something that we do have to, uh, we have to be able to make some kind of decision to say that, uh, sorry, that's not... Uh, uh, you know, I, I don't go along with that. Because in point of fact, the prosperity of the country at the moment is tied up with that. And that's a real problem. Because you can't, you can't just, uh, you just can't get off the bus and say, I, I'm no longer part of the United States society, because we are part of it. So I, apparently, somewhere along the line, you have to say no to some of these things. Yeah, we can't murder our boys to save our pocketbooks. Yeah. Oh, I think it's... Well, there's, there's certainly... I mean, a lot of things are going to happen right now. It, it's it's right at a at a point of it can be it can become very ugly. See, at the moment, uh, right now, the latest thing that's happened is I don't agree with completely, but the Dan Berrigan is sending a telegram to the Pope, saying a bunch of us are supposed to sign it, and I don't particularly want to sign it, asking the Pope to condemn the Vietnam War. But I don't believe in running to the Pope to condemn things. See, I mean that's. See, people are always running for the Pope to condemn Dan Berrigan. So, you know, I mean, we should know enough that I, I don't go for that kind of thing, and I, I think it's useless. But, but, you know, they're trying to do something. Another thing that he wants to do, uh, he wants several priests and rabbis and ministers to sort of stand up publicly in some way or other and receive back draft cards, which the kids are turning in, see. Well, okay, yes, maybe, yes, maybe, no, I don't know. But... Uh, I don't think I'm particularly in a position to do that here. I mean, they're, the way he's got it stacked up, they're going to do this in some sort of a liturgical ceremony in New York somewhere, or something like that, some kind of a common thing. I don't know whether that makes sense either, see. I think that personally, I think what I'm going to do is to work for 
the ordinary political repeal of the draft law, because I think the draft is absolutely wrong right now. First place, people are not needed at all for defense of the country. You've got enough bombs to destroy any enemy we got ten times over. And all of them, you don't need men on yeah, yeah. See, There is no need whatever to draft these people. Drafting them for a war like Vietnam, which is highly dubious, and they're all, I mean, anybody that's got any kind of sense is very bothered by it. Because they know now that they're simply defending a, a, a government that the people don't particularly want. And, you know, what kind of sense is this making? So well, this is a great injustice to these kids to draft them for that. I mean, if it was national defense, real national defense, it would be something else. But, I mean, these kids know that, you know, the country's not in danger. And uh, so it bothers them very much, and they should resist it, actually. But I think they should just repeal the law. I don't see any point in and, uh, like Phil Bergen, did you hear what he did? Yeah, he was right. Say, well, this is all right, but I mean, how many people are going to yeah. understand it, you see? Yeah, yeah. very few. I don't think it was no. true. See, cause, because mm -hmm. part is ambiguous, because what he's saying, see, this whole thing of, of nonviolence, you've got to be awful tactful with nonviolence. If you are using nonviolence simply to tell somebody that you think that he is a bad person, See, this is not the right use of it. And Phil goes and pours blood into the draft board thing. He is saying, these people are murderers. See, well, that's an act of violence, which is all right. I mean, you, you know, there may be a reason for doing it, but, but if you call somebody a murderer, he's going to get mad at you. See, and you've got you've to anticipate the fact that there's going to be a violent clash. See, Gandhi didn't do it that way. I mean, Gandhi would do something that was absolutely crystal clear when he did it. For instance, the poor people of India had to pay tax on their salt, which was obviously unjust. So Gandhi gets a whole bunch of poor people together. They walk six, seven hundred miles from inland to the sea, and on the seashore they make salt. So they take seawater and dry it out, and they go through this symbolic gesture of making salt and then and getting free salt and then going back. Of course, it wasn't a, you know, they didn't get an awful lot of salt. Well, this meant, this was something quite clear, you see. This was saying, okay, you have no right to stop us from getting salt if we want it and so forth. And this is obviously a human necessity and everybody saw it, the English saw it and so forth. But this, uh, these other things are too, um, it's too mysterious. I mean, that there should be some better way of, of mm -hmm. Of saying it, see, I mean, or the, the, the ladies in the draft board, I, the, I saw the picture, see, here are these poor, three or four poor ladies working in the draft board, <laughs> watching a man pour blood into the, into the thing, they obviously had no concept of what it was all about, see? here's this strange man doing this strange thing, and, and uh, it needs to connect, see, that's the... The art of symbolism. Yeah. Yeah. And see, that's, not, that's, a, that's a symbol that's very strong from one point of view. If you want to say, you're bad, that's a good way to say it. See? But if you want to say that this whole thing is unacceptable, you've got to say it. And see, the, the point of nonviolence, what you're really supposed to do is you are supposed to make the other person see something that's true for him as well as for you. See, And he has got to be able to agree from what you are doing that there is a higher truth which is better than what he is committed to. See? And that's awful hard to do. So now with Martin Luther King again, with the Montgomery bus strike, it was real clear. See? I mean, it was, uh, if all the Negroes, if it was worth enough to them to, to not take buses and walk to work or go by car, it, it was clear that they were saying that they should not be put in the back of the bus and so forth and so forth. See? And everybody saw it. I mean, you know, it, it, it got across. And something like that, see, it's... it's, it's there's a, but you have to be able to say it that, that way every time, and it's awful. You've really got to be good to do it. But I don't know what we're coming to in, in, in this race thing and the peace thing. We're liable to have an awful mess. Supposing that the war does stop now, supposing they drag all these fellows back here and they're all mad, and a lot of them come back, and then they run into a lot of racial problems. And now they all know how to handle guns. And they're all, you know, violent. And 
that's the one thing that I think that we're going to be up against in this country. We're going to be in an awful mess of people being indiscriminately, just irrationally violent in sort of all sorts of busting out in all directions, and that's going to be a... There's a lot of irrational violence right Already, now. yeah, but I mean... Let's... Was it Cleveland? Everywhere last summer, it was all over. Uh, I'm always getting very interesting invitations, which I can't take, but I got one this summer, which was really... In fact, one of the, one of the people connected with it is coming down at the end of this week. This is in Chicago. And this is, there's a gang in Chicago, uh, a Negro teenage gang that suddenly became social conscious and highly responsible and started developing into a, uh, a sort of a protective organization for kids in, this, in these tough areas and branching out. And now they call themselves a nation. And this is the, uh, what are they called, the Black Rangers or some, some name like that. It's the nation of the Black Rangers, see. And they're tied up with this Presbyterian church in Chicago, which called a meeting of a few Christian churchmen and these black rangers and some Negro black power leaders, like from Detroit and so forth. And a friend of mine was at it, and I was invited to go. And the thing was very interesting. I mean, because, you know, this, this is the real stuff. This isn't any... These are the people that are really fighting mad and... and, and there were a few white people that sort of tried to get up and, and get some kind of a compromise thing. There's just no compromise possible. And uh, what they are, they're talking revolution, which they, they, they're not going to get anywhere with it. But it, that, that's the kind of thing that you're, that you're... See, these people are absolutely convinced that you can't do anything for this country short of a revolution. Well, I, mean, I wonder in their minds what they think they'll accomplish. They're not going to accomplish anything, see. Yeah, but I wonder what they think yeah. they'll accomplish. What's, what's involved, I think, is, is again a problem of, of a, it's partly a sort of identity thing, it's sort of a dramatic. Maybe they're just going through a kind of a period where they're trying to give themselves a sense of, of being completely independent of the white man, see. Where they can operate without him and so forth, but they can't. No, no. And the injustices have been so gross. Yeah, it's been so bad. Yeah. But you see, it's getting to the point where they just won't communicate on any other terms. See, they actually what the way these people are talking, they won't communicate with a white man who doesn't support a revolution. That's the only kind of white man they communicate with. That's what it, that's that's where we're going to be. See, we're, we're, we're past the situation where we were, um, I mean, with up till Selma, it was a com still a completely different thing. It was still, you know, everybody was in it together and we were all, and then, of course, that failed, see. It didn't work. Mm -hmm. Because the, the, the South simply wouldn't pay attention to these laws. Laws are made and then they won't keep them. We have this Ku Klux Klan right yeah. now bombing. Yeah. <laughs> that one house was bombed, this, the... the Girl, she's married now. She had been a postulant with us for a while. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, we got them. They're starting up around here, too. Well, they're quite strong. <laughs> they're starting down in uh, Louisville. We've got them yeah. going and getting busy. Well, uh, there's another angle to that. One bunch you should all pray for. These, this is a very good group. These, this is called the Committee of Southern Churchmen. They're mostly Protestant. And... Uh, one of them is down in Nashville. He's a real character. He's a marvelous guy. He's a fellow called Will Campbell. He's a good friend of mine. He keeps coming up all the time. And uh, he preaches to the clan. He says, the guys you've got to convert is the clan. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he is a friend of the head of the clan in North Carolina. It was a man called uh, Raymond Cranford or some name like that. And this Will Campbell goes and he, he's accepted down the, in the Cranford household. He's a friend. He's, a, he's our ultra-liberal friend. And he comes in there and he, he just, uh, and uh, Cranford's wife was sick and Will Campbell was emptying bed pants for her, looking after her and all that sort of thing. And he's right in with him, but he tells him, see, you, uh, you've got to be reconciled. See. Well, he, they listen to him. They, I mean, of course, the, what he runs into, see, he runs into the old southern problem is that Raymond Cranford will take, drive him down the road, 
And there's a house of his white sharecropper, and there's a house of his black sharecropper. He says they're both equally good, see, and then, you know, and well, he's my friend too, and that's, and you run up against that old. But still, I, I think he's, uh, see, his idea is much deeper than just simply convincing them. What he's trying to do is to maintain a line of communication and not have this barrier, see. I mean, another barrier by which you say, KKK inhuman, you know. See, he says, these guys are human too. This is, this is Will, Will Campbell's theme song. He says, even the clan is human, so therefore you've got to go to them. See? And which is true. I mean, this, this, is the, this is the real Christian view of the thing. And that's the, that's the thing that we have today. We can't possibly. You don't line up on the side of a revolution and you don't line up on the side of a counter-revolution. You line up on the side of people. And, and, and what you do as a Christian all down the line is wherever there is a human presence, you are present to it, see. And wherever, wherever there is a person, you are personally in communication. And there Christ can work, see. Where there is presence, there is God. And if you close down so that there's no longer any presence, then the thing is finished. Then you communicate by bullets. And in this country, what we're going to come to eventually is just simply this kind of communication where the Christian will be the one person left see, who is communicating across all the boundaries. And he's the one hope left for a convergence back to a kind of unity. But do you think the point, I mean, in this, in this country, that will be the line which must, which must be crossed or accepted is the color, the, the racial situation? Do you think that's the... Well, I think right now that's kind of the typical situation, but there's much more you think there, there's there, much there, more there are others, that. too? There's much more than that, because, I mean, that there's so much... Just take the division between the Klan and the liberal, see? I mean, for the, for the, for the liberal, the Klan is uh, inhuman. And for the for the clan, the liberal is a, is a rat, you know. And this is among white people. Yes. yes. Of course, the, with, the, with the Negro thing, it's visible. See, it's a real clear. <clears throat> but I mean, there's so much. Uh, uh, we haven't changed a bit as white people go. I mean, we've, you know, the the Protestant Catholic thing has all of a sudden uh, the the barriers have the barriers have dropped, but the other barriers have gone up. See. Liberal Catholics and liberal Protestants are much closer now than liberal Catholics and conservative Catholics. Yes. I and mean, then the barrier is there. They, 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 they move the fence around. And there hasn't been any real change. It's just that all of a sudden everybody got a new view. So he's my friend instead of him. Um, Father, my brother is a sociologist. He was giving us a few days of uh, a course for the end of the summer. He was telling us that more or less they would, pre they would be ready to predict and uh, in terms almost of a certain communist uh, philosophy, that integration will be achieved on the day that the white man recognizes that the black race is economically or politically uh, advantageous to himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that when the, the, mm -hmm. uh, the black power yeah. is revealed over the space of time to be of uh, to bring yeah. advantage to the white man, yeah. and at that day he'll be ready to break down values, exactly. and not sure. before. It's American yeah. values. It's yeah, American. That's, 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 right. that's what we're pragmatic. That's what with this country. And it won't come before that either. Yeah. yeah. No, they're certainly not going to do it out of pure no. benevolence. No. Yeah. No. No revolution either. No, no, revolution. no Christian no. motives are just uh, no. the revolution thing. No. Got to, the revolution is just going to make it worse. No. But you see, what they can do, though, is since the black people are now concentrated in the inner cities, they can make the inner city practically inaccessible to black men if they want to. You know, it can be so dangerous to go to work that you can't go to work. Yeah, but they, they, I don't know. I will. Uh, we had, you know, we had the election for the governor of Mississippi, yeah. and uh, they could have, um, there are more black people than yeah. white people, yeah. but evidently they didn't, they didn't well, come out to vote. Well, yeah, yeah. That's scary, I guess. Yes, I, I wonder, are there jobs and things like that? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, and anybody who's got a, I mean, in the South, a black man has not a chance. If he owes... Any money? Oh, they're treated and, like yeah. uh, like you take care of your cows. Yeah, sure. Well, the cows are better taken care of. Yeah, no. What I mean is that yeah. we feed them and we clothe them. Yeah. You know, we keep them warm and this, but uh, but. Well, they don't there. even feed them in yeah. warm. Keep them warm. Mm -hmm. Keep them close. Well, they'll tell you this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now we see in the south, all 
okay, you, you own a little store. So you have to have licenses for this, that, and the other thing. And there's always some, you know, there's, they'll arrange it so that there's some licenses you don't have, that you don't know about. Yeah. And then when the time comes where you haven't got your license, bang it off. It's the end of your store. And it's just, it's a part of the system. So they all move north and they all move into the cities. But you see, the thing is that uh, what we have to do is not get, I mean, not be too tragic about it, see? I mean, there, there are still these all sorts of human values and that we, by not getting too scared and too lined up with the wrong kind of reaction to the thing, can keep avenues open and not to worry about these divisions and distinctions. Even there'll be a lot of black people around who are hating white people now. All right, we don't have to be as scared of them. And treat them, you know, be friends with them anyway. And uh, just simply get back to the big fundamental things. We trust God. We believe in love. We believe in people. And if there are enough people around who believe in love, enough to want to practice it, that keeps the thing alive. See, it's the same thing as the silence bit and the contemplation and everything else. There's, there are a few basic things that we know are true. We know that love is true. We know that it's real. And we know that all these other things are real. And we just simply commit ourselves to what we know to be real. And if people like it, fine, and if they don't like it, well, too bad. It's not our responsibility. We just, our, our job is to hang on to what we know to be real, and of course we have enough trouble doing that. We're, we're not always that faithful, and we sort of let things slide sometimes. There's a new book about, uh, about this, uh, that's quite a popular one I'm reading. I'm doing a review for the magazine, which Will Campbell and these people edit. I, I'm, I'm sort of on my staff of it, actually. It's, it's a good magazine. But this, this is a story. It's called The Confessions of Nat Turner. It's about a slave revolution that took place a hundred years ago in Virginia. And the whole idea is to uh, uh, kind of look at the, this whole problem in, in a real stark kind of form. And uh, this whole southern thing is fine, but it's kind of a myth, see? It's, you know, it's, it's great. Uh, it's, it's the idea that William Faulkner had and people like that had. And, it's, and you can always point to one or two real humane people that are, you know, the real, had the big mansion and were so good to the Negroes. And I know a family in Barnstown that's like that. A great big mansion. And, and this Negro family's been working for them for years and they're just like another member of the family and all that. But uh, it's fine, but how many... No, this is this is just one little an two people, and then and then uh, you go to Harlem and you've got thousands and thousands and thousands of people that no white man ever knows they don't know they exist. And living, see the the tragic thing about the slums is that a negro a negro family, a poor negro family in the tenements, pays more proportionately for what they're not getting mm -hmm. than a family on Park Avenue pays. They're not paying more absolutely, but in proportion to what they get. Mm -hmm. That's this, true in the corner store neighborhoods yeah. in Mississippi because yeah. they can't go to the big shopping centers. They don't have yeah. a way to get there. Yeah. And down here they'll charge more for bread, sure. more for milk. Sure. People make far less than the white man and people. Yeah, yeah. And this, this is the terrible thing, see, and, the, and they know it now. See, that, oh. that, that they've, they've, they've caught on to this now. And they know that if they... And they can't charge things, maybe, or if they do, they charge them in such a way that they're simply slaves okay. to, the, to the store, and, so, and they realize that. And they realize that they're paying an enormous amount for a rat-infested apartment, and then yeah. people aren't going to get the rats out, and, and they, they want the lights to work. They've got to whistle for months before anybody will come and even look at them. And, we know this poor because they paid insurance on her father uh, for many years, and when he died, there was some little clause yeah, she didn't, didn't get a thing, not a thing. But you see, I mean, just put yourself in the position of somebody like that. I mean, you'd be so fine, man. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, when a person has had that year after year, and then all of a sudden somebody's breaking windows and stealing TVs, oh, my heavens, I'd go in there and clean the store out. Don't mind. <laughs> really. <laughs> and if, uh, by, by any ordinary moral theology, they've got a perfect right to. Mm -hmm. They're entitled to that. And nobody can say they're stealing. Well, you know, we have this old college sister, she's from South. 
which makes oh, yeah. it more interesting. Yeah. But one time we were out and um, we had to go to a restaurant to eat, and so we got to the door and she said, "Do you think I can come in?" And it just didn't dawn on us before, yeah. you know, and it just struck everybody. Yeah. So Honey, if you can't come in here, we're going to make a personal call to the president. Yeah. So um, we went in, but we the service was very bad. And yeah. I yeah. know it was because she was Sure, nervous. sure. Yeah. That's what she ran into. And then when they were, there was one real heartbreaking thing that, that uh, I read about the riots it was in Newark. And they were breaking into stores and so forth. And so forth. some poor lady, obviously, you know, the, some good soul, had stole, stole some canned food or something like that. And the cops got her. And they had her down in the police station. And they said, and they were kidding her. They were sort of ribbing her and say, well, you're, you're, you're just Miss American shoplifter number one for this year. We're going to take your picture. And they were saying all these sort of mean things. And the poor thing finally broke down crying. And you could just see him. And then she was just some poor, good person, you know, who just, uh, got involved in all this thing, and that these people were just being so cruel without realizing it. And that's the way it is. I don't know, it's just such a... Complex problem. It's a terrible thing. And nobody can solve it, you know, unless they, yeah. they really get terribly busy on top and do an enormous amount of it. If they, if they put all the money they put in the Vietnam War into solving this, they might get somewhere, but even then you'd still have Money won't solve it. You'd still have problems. No. Well, it's, see, those are, I mean, you can't think about our life without thinking of these things, no. see. I mean, if we think of ourselves just in a w different world, we're not being true. Well, Father, when we go upstairs at night and look out, we can see the windows down below. You know, these shacks where the people Yeah, are yeah, there. yeah, sure. And that's all over the world. I mean, see, this is... So, when you look down there, I think what you'd see if you were looking out over... So look at Rio, for example, and then Brazil. Mm -hmm. it's, all up on, it's all up on the heights there. See, and you're downtown, and you're this beautiful city, and there's terrible shacks on the hillsides there. All over the place. And Rio, I mean, awful poverty. Um, what can be done, though, Father? You, in your own, you know, particular capacity, can do a great deal. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's a whole... Uh, I mean, you know, people do these supposedly revolutionary thing, but it doesn't help much. Yeah. I mean, it's such a fantastic problem. It really is, Father, because, you know, you live in such a... Uh, even if you're in a hermitage, it's... Sure. <laughs> and you have everything. Sure. And you live I mean, you know, you're hungry, so you go down and get some food. And, mm -hmm. and well, you, well, we just buy nothing that we need. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it, this isn't true to me. Well, one thing... I don't want to scandalize anybody, but one thing, I haven't got adequate plumbing up there yet. It's the cold weather, I, I'm sure a lot of poor. <laughs> but it's, but it's, really, it's really something, you know. You've got a cold, and you've got to go out in the cold in the middle of the night. You stop and think a little bit. And it wakes you up. <laughs> but uh, that's about the last hardship that, that there is up there. When do you see that just around here? I mean, there's a lot of poverty right in this area. You go down the road and you see houses with ten children in and big holes in the walls. Yeah, you, know. you get off the highway in Kentucky. Yeah, <laughs> you get off the highway, yeah. you can really just go back over the. I mean, as I was saying, over where Father Abbott's going to be, you're just on the way over there. But on the other hand, well, the one thing that that makes a little difference is that it'll be some real terrible falling down house with a brand new TV air. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but still, it's. I mean, the, the poor little kids. Yeah. They're freezing. And it's, uh, I don't know, there just aren't any answers to all these things. You know, you do what you can, but let's see what it has to be. The only way to do it is by an enormous amount of planning from the top, and what do we know about that? Yeah. But all you can do is sort of hope and pray that somebody one day will start doing this, because the, what's holding it back is the greed of people who simply are... I mean, stand to profit by that. So the reason why the things aren't changed is because somebody is getting more money out of it. It's it's more profitable for somebody for that child to suffer. And that's the that's where that's where well I mean we can't be poor like those people. But we should to some extent learn to dissociate ourselves from the ones who are profiting from it. And the where the problem comes in is they may be our benefactors. 
and uh, how do you know, you know? And it's a, um, this is what the saints used to do in the Middle Ages. They wouldn't take money from a bishop who was who got in by simony or something like that. Well, what are we going to do? I don't know. <laughs> Examine, what have you got stock in? You know? <laughs> can't do that. But still, I mean, if, you know, it, uh, it is really a moral problem. So long as we don't do it in a pharisaical way. But. Yeah. Well, you know, it's so amazing that Christianity is the most wonderful thing that has ever come, and yet it seems to have touched the lives of most people so little. Yeah. Even people who would pride themselves on being good Christians, yeah. I mean, gee. Well, isn't that the way it is all the way through the Bible, though? That's you know, right. I mean, see, the, the, it seems to be that that's part of the message. I mean, maybe that's the meaning of many are called pure chosen. It isn't so much that, that uh, you know, people are, are consciously bad and so forth, but, but they respond to the call on this particular level, but they don't really follow it. See. And uh, see, the, one of the things that the Bible teaches us are, are, the, are the basic things that God, God's thoughts about man. And that the other thing that we have to remember is, that, okay, these people are not doing right and so forth, but nobody's doing right. We're all sinners, see. And on the one hand, all through the Bible, you get this, this notion, God speaks and man doesn't listen. And then on the other hand, the mercy of God is constant. And there is no, you can't defeat it, and his promises are absolutely constant. And, and so as Christians, see, the thing is, not to always be on the right side. You can't, see. I mean, a Christian is not going to be a person who always knows where justice is and always is absolutely, you know, where everything is crystal clean, that's where he's going to be, you know, you can't tell. But the Christian is the man who is aware of this other reality, that in man there is always falsity and infidelity, and in God is absolute fidelity, and in the mercy of God is this absolute fidelity. And so therefore the Christian rejects nobody, and yet tries to keep, you know, from associating with anything that's going to hurt other people, but in the end stands for the mercy of God. And that's Really, the, the, the real witness that every Christian has to really stand up for is that God's mercy is without repentance. That God never takes back his mercy. Because that's, that's the one where we really need it. Because we're in a world where lots of people are in despair. And the Christian witness of mercy is not, after all, that credible to a lot of people. Because it's not really that, that profound. And that's, that's where we really have to to, you know, bear witness to the Word of God. And of course, that's, that's where the whole church is really, that's, there's the real renewal, is in that. And it isn't a question of being on the right side, being on the side of peace only and that sort of thing. Those are just, you know, it's just partial, it's symbolic. There's a lot of going on. I think it was U.S. News and World Report yeah. on the side of groping. Um, I don't know. I don't know too much about him. I know one fellow that worked for him. Prominent yeah. Jeremiah. Yeah. Thing. But these people are perhaps just aiming at this problem. You know, they yeah. can't be. They're not on the side of right in the sense. Yeah. You know, they're not being yeah. approved. Their tactics may not be approved. Yeah. But in some way, they're trying to get at the core of the problem. Yeah. At sure. least to get sure. the Christian sure. message across. Sure. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, to see something like that is a, a, a real. Uh, you know, a definite attempt to formulate the thing in political terms where something can be done. See, obviously you can't just do it purely on ideological terms. You've got to sort of uh, dig in and try to help people who are in trouble. And the only way you can really do it is by uh, something has to be done in the laws, you know. And there has to be a change. There has to be something where you can't just do it by giving people nickels. <laughs> And that perhaps it's the only way that it would wake up the rest of the Christians. Yeah, the but the other thing is so that they don't do it, see. No. And when, and when it does get into law, it gets to be so impersonal and so sort of, by the time it's been through all the machinery, it's, yeah. it might just as well be nothing. They build a whole new, you know, big new apartments and so forth, and then they go in there and they have all sorts of new problems. And the race problem isn't settled. They've got a slightly better... No, I mean, well, I mean, you know, for instance, his priest and, and yeah. the particular approach. Yeah, well, he's working on mostly open housing, isn't he? Isn't that yes, right? yes. Yeah. But see, now the open housing thing, that only affects a small minority of people. Because for most people, open housing is no problem at all for the right, Negro. Yeah. I mean, they've, they've got no place to go. Open housing is fine for the top crust of the Negroes. 
And it's a good symbolic thing, it's fine, but, but most Negroes, open housing, if you have all the open housing you want, they couldn't afford it. It's not hitting the core. No. Mm-hmm. But it's all right, it's, a, it's right on. Well, I guess I've got to run along. <laughs>